Hello, and welcome to Galen Data's Medical Device Connectivity Innovation Webinar Series. My name is Keith Drake. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Galen Data. Our topic today is venture capitalist perspective on the medical device industry. Uh, we're going to be exploring a lot of important key questions that focus on how you, our audience, can create value now to maximize the potential for future investment. Uh, I'm very excited about our panel today. We've got a fantastic panel. Nat Clarkson is a managing partner with CFV Ventures. Nat is a finance professional with experience in private equity, investment banking, capital markets, and government relations, and a work history on three continents. His current focus includes leading the Carolinas Health uh, Innovation and Technology Alliance that we'll hear about from Nat in a minute or two. Charlie Plochet is a partner at S3 Ventures. Charlie's current and previous S3 portfolio company board service includes BrainCheck, Tango Health, and TVA Medical that was acquired by Becton Dickinson. Timothy Marks is a venture partner with Baird Capital. He works with Baird's venture team to pursue new investment opportunities and help build value within the existing portfolio. Tim is also president of Marks Capital Advisors, an advisory firm supporting single family office clients. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for your time today. Uh, we'll briefly go over some uh, logistics. At any time to our audience, you can submit your Q&A session questions in the questions window in your GoToWebinar console. Uh, there are a couple handouts available uh, overviewing Galen Data and some of our guest organizations. They are available for download now. Uh, we're going to conduct two brief polls during the webinar to learn more about you, our audience, and you'll be receiving by email a follow-up email, a recording of the webinar for your future use. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time before we dive into our topics, uh, learning more about you gentlemen, your organizations, and just the perspective you have on uh, the medical device industry. Uh, Nat, why don't we start with you, give you a couple minutes to tell us about yourself and uh, your organization. Sounds great. Thanks, Keith. Um, so we uh, run a few things. We run a, an accelerator um, called uh, RevTech Labs, which does um, health tech as well as uh, fintech. Um, and um, a venture capital fund that right now invests primarily into uh, financial technology, early stage fintech companies, although we do have a lot of overlap. For us, we have a broad definition of fintech, so that includes things like um, anything having to do with revenue cycle management or process improvement, but also uh, insure tech. Uh, and we've noticed with a lot of our insure tech partners, there's a big interest in anything that helps people live longer and healthier lives, saves them money, uh, so they're, they're interested in that space. Um, we're starting to get a lot deeper into, into healthcare uh, innovation and to help facilitate that, we wanted to recreate some of the things that made us successful on the FinTech side. Uh, and, and there we've got more than 700 mentors and subject matter experts. We've got great partnerships with a number of uh, leading financial institutions. So we have a lot of resources we can draw from. Um, we just graduated our, uh, our 14th cohort. Um, and so to recreate that, uh, we basically took a step back and created what we call the Carolinas Health Innovation Technology Alliance or CHEETAH. For short, and that is made up of four major groups to help kind of a fifth, uh, and that is um, government academia. So we have all the research universities within the Carolinas, for example, uh, the private sector, and then drivers, which are uh, venture capital and, um, uh, and, and seasoned entrepreneurs that can, can add additional value. The platform is designed to help in a number of ways. Uh, it's launching right about now, should be up and running uh, by Q1. Uh, number one, it helps uh, tie together those resources for internal collaboration. So um, we help companies plug into the research universities, for example, and help spin out uh, things from there. So if they've developed something, some IP, for example, and they need help developing it, we may be able to do it from a venture studio perspective. But also, you know, they're often looking for solutions uh, to solve certain problems. So we try to do great searches worldwide and plug those solutions into the providers. The idea is to use uh, resources uh, as well as capital where, where necessary to, um, to help drive success. So, um, you know, maybe that's a POC, uh, that's co-development with, with uh, a provider, for example, um, which can help really move the ball forward. We call some of these the, uh, the, the commercialization residency program, where it's, it really is kind of um, growing that product, hopefully in something that that provider or partner will then buy at the end of the process. And then, of course, it's good for them. 
it, it's in everyone's best interest, especially if they have um, some equity to uh, to um, sell it more broadly. Um, so that, and then the other piece we're doing is we're, we're taking that those resources and plugging them out to the the greater uh, the broader community, um, and, and hopefully having some partnerships with um, Nordic Health uh, and some others here in the United States. So it's a great way um, to tie together things. Uh, and if anybody's interested in any of those resources, certainly feel free to reach out. Um, I think my my contact information will be at the end here. Um, but you know, again, it's another way that we can help bring resources there, not only capital but intellectual um, resources corporate thing, uh, corporate contacts, the ability to help move the ball uh, in coordinated and, and efficient ways uh, for the development of, of um, medical devices, for example, with, with um, access to good quality management systems, et cetera. All right, all right, exciting, exciting times. Uh, good luck with that. I'm interested to, to hear about your successes. Charlie, over to you. Uh, why don't you tell us about S3 Ventures? Yes, happy to Keith, and thanks again for, for having us today. Um, so S3 Ventures is, is a classic kind of traditional venture capital firm. I won't read through all these bullets here, but uh, we're basically the largest VC firm that's primarily focused on Texas businesses. We invest across kind of three buckets there you see in the second large bullet, business technology, consumer digital, and healthcare technology. Uh, it's primarily kind of B2B SaaS is what we typically do, including some healthcare B2B SaaS that we've done, and then a handful of med tech. I, I said we we look at a lot of stuff in medtech. We've made a handful of investments there, kind of traditional medical devices. When I, when I say medtech, we don't do anything kind of biotech, pharma. It is your traditional devices. Um, but you can't be focused on Texas and also just focused on medtech because there's just not enough to go around just in the in the state of Texas. But um, currently investing out of our sixth fund. It's 200 million in size. We got about 600 million across uh, the six funds. Um, our whole team's based in Austin, Texas, and we will we will look at other markets besides Texas, but we don't tend to look in Silicon Valley or kind of the New York area, but primarily not, not kind of Silicon Valley where there's so much other access to capital. Um, as you can see now in the second bullets, we're typically writing checks 250K to 10 million with our kind of bread and butter being a three to $5 million check leading a five to $10 million round in a company. Um, the, the bottom bullet, we're, we're backed by a single family LP, which is super unique. Um, it allows us, to, they're one LP across all the funds. so. Allows us to extend our funds to be really patient with capital. We're not looking to have an exit to go raise the next fund. Um, in some cases, when companies have in later stage, or LP can come alongside us and invest with us and allow us to get really deep into companies you know, into the tens of millions in some cases over many rounds of funding versus we cap out at 10 million or something like that. Um, you know, talking on healthcare, I thought it'd be good to highlight two of them, kind of two exits we've had in a couple of years, kind of there in the successful exits, TBA Medical, which was a company that made a uh, made a minimally invasive way to create an AV fistula for dialysis patients, where the standard of care pre previous to, to TBA was a very invasive surgery that um, you had to go, you know, be put under in the OR, very expensive, and the outcomes were really, really bad, you know, success rate 50% or less in creating the fistula. And TBA created a very innovative way to do the procedure minimally invasively, 30, 45 minute procedure with wild success, you know, 95% plus success rates. And what we really love there is you took a a surgery, kind of a non-device space, and you deviced it. And so um, that's like a, a really, if, if you can take a non-device space and device it, that's a, a huge innovation in medtech for a whole lot of reasons. And so that was something we really liked about them. They were sold to uh, Beckton Dickinson, really the, the, the group Baird, which had been acquired by Beckton Dickinson um, a few years ago. And then the other one is called Assessa, which is here in Austin as well. Um, they had a minimally invasive way to treat uh, fibroids in women. And so previous to the assessive technique, the primary uh, option for women who had fibroids was to get a hysterectomy, which uh, is a huge invasive procedure, has tons of side effects. And many of these women are getting fibroids younger and they still want to be able to get pregnant, things like that. And so assessive provided a, a very minimally invasive way to go treat those fibroids if they get pregnant again. Um, and we thought that was a great innovation. And they were actually acquired by Whole Logic just a few months ago. Um, we had a nice upfront payment there and, and we're still kind of tied to them through some earnout payments for the next few years so those are two i thought would be uh be worthwhile to highlight and, and my background i started my career in corporate banking and private equity investing for a few years went to business school at ut here in austin and um got involved with s3 during that time that was almost 11 years ago now so the firm was about 40 million under management at the time and uh i've helped kind of grow the firm and moved up the ranks to partner over the years and uh been a, been a fun ride. So I really have spent the majority of my career in, in venture capital. Well, that's exciting. So you're in Austin, we're in Houston, we're neighbors in Texas terms. Yep. Well, we're looking at stuff in Houston. 
Another company down there, BrainCheck, which is a Houston company that's a kind of a software as a service med tech that's FDA regulated that uh, helps diagnose early onset of Alzheimer's that uh, is a more recent investment of ours that I'm, I'm on the board of. Very good. Tim, we're going to shift gears and turn it over to you. You've got a lot going on at Baird Capital. Can you share that with us? Sure. Sounds good. Well, first of all, thank you, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to be here with you. So Baird Capital is the direct investing arm of R.W. Baird & Company. R.W. Baird is a 100-plus-year-old financial services firm that does everything from you know, equity and fixed income research to investment banking to private wealth management and then Baird Capital. Baird Capital is a dual platform as well for both venture capital and private equity. Each raises its own fund. We just share the back, the back office you know, backbone. So if you hear a Baird Capital, you might be hearing of the private equity or the venture uh, arm. So I work in the venture arm. We invest in both B2B SaaS companies that are industry agnostic, as well as healthcare companies. On the healthcare side, we'll, uh, we'll take a look at anything that is not a therapeutic. So no drug discovery, um, development, commercialization, just about everything else we'll take a look at. We're investing out of our fifth fund. It's a $215 million fund. Uh, we typically come into Series A, Series B, writing a six to $8 million uh, initial check, uh, $10, $15 million plus minus over the life cycle or investing life cycle of a company. We lead about 95% of our deals. And so you know, we rarely tag on to a, uh, you know, a term sheet that's already out there. So it's good. And my job is down here in Texas. We really wanted to um, build a presence and not allow Charlie to be all by himself down here in Texas. And uh, wanted to build a presence and really be at the tip of the spear because we see a lot going on in Texas and across the South, uh, Southern United States more generally. So really start to identify companies early on and start to build a relationship 12, 18 months out from when they're going to need funding. Because again, since we leave most of our deals, if you don't find out about a company raising money uh, pretty early, you know, a lot of times you miss the boat. Right? And so um, here's just a, what you can see on the screen is a select, some select portfolio companies, most of these out of fund four. Uh, a couple interesting ones to highlight. Emids has already exited, really good exit. That was a um, BPO company. And so we're really proud of that. Pneumotics exited uh, last month. Really good time to be a molecular diagnostic testing company, especially if you had something FDA approved that could um, you know, test for COVID early early on and with a 24 hour turnaround. So I was one of the first that had that very short turnaround. And then Greenlight is a company that you know we're really excited about, um, which has an RNA based solution for both agriculture and vaccine development, which again is another hot topic right now. And so that company has, you know, since we invested about two years ago, has picked up another hundred plus million dollars in funding. So, you know, a lot of a lot of really good stuff going on in the portfolio. And, you know, just otherwise happy to be here with you guys and and have a great conversation. Uh, as Charlie said, and now a little bit about my personal background. I joined Baird about two years ago and st concurrently started my um, family office advisory services firm. You know, prior to that, I went to school at, for undergrad at Penn State University, went and got my MBA at Stanford University, and spent most of you know, 15 plus years at Boston Consulting Group, where I left as a partner and managing director, doing a lot of work in both industrial as well as a lot of work in medtech. All right, wonderful. Thank you, all three of you guys, Nat, Charlie, and, and Tim, for sharing your background. We've got just such a wide range of expertise, experience, and I think our audience is going to benefit from that as we move forward through our presentation and discussion today. Uh, as a brief reminder to our audience, uh, just to let you know about the Galen Cloud, we provide a secure, compliant, and turnkey cloud connectivity platform. It is purpose-built for medical devices, both physical devices and software as a medical device. It is platform comp compatible with all cloud infrastructures, not just Amazon Web Services. Uh, we are ISO 13485 certified, uh, compliant with FDA, HIPAA, GDPR, CCPA, the whole alphabet soup. And it's a very flexible and robust platform, configurable for data access, data display, uh, alerts, and much, much more. We're going to have uh, think of it in terms of four mini roundtable discussions today. We'll all present a question, hear from our panelists their advice. 
uh, those four topics are breakpoints. What are the key differentiators? What are the um, uh, achievements that you guys are looking for that attract your attention in the life cycle of a medical device? Then we're going to shift gears and talk about COVID-19 and ask you what investments are more attractive to you given today's environment and perhaps what technologies and solutions are less uh, likely to attract your attention. Uh, and then we'll talk about the, uh, the mechanics of getting in front of you, pitching, breaking through the clutter, especially given travel restrictions these days to, pre to, uh, to present a medical device solution. And then lastly, uh, looking ahead, uh, both next year and beyond, what is your focus? What, what do you, where do you think this industry, uh, what, in, uh, what direction do you think this industry is heading? So four great questions. Before we get to them, uh, we're gonna run a poll so right now in your uh, go to meet go to webinar console you should see this poll coming up and we're going to ask you what type of organization do you represent are you a medical device manufacturer do you represent an organization that has a software as a medical device solution do you represent a design or development company within the medical device space uh, perhaps you represent a quality or regulatory organization and then if you don't fit in any of those uh, any of those categories please select other so optional poll but we do appreciate understanding uh, who we're reaching and who is attending our webinars medical device manufacturer software as a medical device design development company for devices quality or regulatory organization or other Give everybody just a couple more seconds to uh, enter your responses. I see we've got just about everybody's participating and we will go ahead and close the poll now. All right, so on to our discussion. The first topic today is breakpoints, key differentiators attracting venture capital attention. Uh, Charlie, I'm going to go to you first and ask if you could start addressing the question, what are the typical milestones that investors like yourselves expect to see from a medical device company at each funding round and stage of maturity? What, what, what gets your attention? Yep. Um, you know, a lot of ways to answer this question. I'll, I'll say that with the software as a medical device, let's put that in a different bucket because that's more around product development, early revenue, trying traditional software stuff. But if we think about traditional medical devices, um, when we think about it, it's a unique, very unique and different than a software company because a med device company really lives three very different lives. In the earliest stages, it is an R&D company trying to build this device. Maybe you put in some animals and then as it matures, you move into a clinical and regulatory uh, company where you're doing FDA trials and things like that. And those different companies can take different skill sets to scale and um, have different milestones within each. And then eventually you get FDA approval or whatever and you go to kind of your sales and marketing, go to market which is a, a different set of milestones. And so I think as you think about funding, thinking about it in those three buckets is key. And, you know, typical milestones are, are it's hard to say because it's just such a broad bucket, but I would say, you know, in the clinical stage, right? I would say you always want, I've seen some companies come to me and they, we want to raise $20 million to go through all those stages. Well, that's not going to, nobody's going to give you money to do that. Um, so you want to come in and say, okay, I'm clinical. I've made this device, I've put it in 10 pigs or cows or whatever, and hey, we're gonna go try our first man. Or we have a little bit more work on the device that's gonna get us to this to get us to our first man. And so these, these are these milestones and I need this money to get there. Or I've already done it in a bunch of animals on first and man, now I'm gonna go try the first 50 patients and get a six month follow-up. Even though I know I need 150 patients, but very clear kind of milestones in those buckets. And then once you're FDA approval, then it's hey, I'm gonna go to the markets. And so, I think as you think about fundraising, having specific goals, and it, and it really needs to be something that creates value, right? Like not saying I'm gonna go from 20 to 25 patients, but not have a year follow up on them or, or something. It needs to be something material to where you're gonna get the next set of investors interested in the company. And I think, you know, investors can very widely buy those three kind of phases of a med medical device company. Um, so I would just be really thoughtful as you think about, think about those milestones and have something that's gonna be value creating within the window of kind of the timeline of the money you're trying to raise in that current round. Tim, what gets your attention as far as achievements? Sure, I mean, echoing most of, or all of Charlie's comments. So trying to build on that, I would say that it depends, again, as Charlie alluded to on the stage and also the type of device. So let's talk about this uh, stage first. Early on, if if you're thinking angel seed i think what you're looking at is all right is the market size 
big enough to um and how much money do we think we'll need to go into this company you know all told all right is there a return there i mean you're going to ask that at every single stage but i think at the basic level you say how much money is this company going to need how much money am i willing to invest and what is the potential exit value historically for a company that looks like this all right do those numbers work for me because if the numbers don't work for you off the bat well you, know, you pass and move on after that i think early stage is all right is this based on some fundamentally decent science and if we believe that is this the right team to get it done i mean that essentially that's it right on the, on the first couple of checks that come in you're betting on that there's a some a decent level of science there the market is going to be big enough to have a solid exit if they're successful and that you believe the team is solid enough to get it done then as you progress i mean again as you get into a and b and the, the rounds are a little different in different places and the like so as charlie said you can't get too specific on that but you do um move into i would say roughly speaking if we enter it in a round you know your typical a that means, but your typical a we're looking to see at least some large animal data uh perhaps even have it finished but definitely some large animal data and um you know a product that you believe is almost or nearly complete I mean, assuming that the uh the clinical trials hold up and when you're looking at uh stage b right you kind of want to see first in human data or at least a little bit and you may have to then fund the pivotal and the like but you will likely want to see uh first in human and what i've been mentioning you know as i said at the very beginning it also depends on what type of device what i've been talking about so far is your typical pma pathway right because at the pma pathway there's a usually a lot bigger exit and a lot more work that needs to be done therefore a lot more capital that winds up going into the company if you're gonna if you're building a, a better mousetrap or just kind of a classic non de novo 510k you're gonna have to look to be a little bit more um, capital efficient to get through the process because a lot of times by you know la a later a or a b stage what the investors really want to see is early commercial traction you know the days of getting a 510k across the line and having an immediate exit that were prevalent five or so uh, i would say 10 years ago, less so five years ago, but still around, today they almost don't exist. And the strategics are really gonna ask you to prove that and get some commercial traction you know, before, you're, uh, before you're likely to exit. And therefore you're gonna need a commercialization round uh, to really start selling your product. So I do think you know, there's a big difference when you're looking at PMAs versus 510Ks in the amount of you know, cash you can be uh, willing to put in upfront when it comes to product development and clinical trials. Um, you know, for for the type of returns that investors are looking at for uh, at their entry stage. Very good, Nat. What do you have to add? So we focus uh, more on the software side. Just kind of Clark, Charlie put off to the side at the beginning. Um, both at the, <clears throat> and the, I guess we would think about things um, on the medical device as a uh, or software as a medical device, but but also on things that are not necessarily uh, devices themselves, but for example, like Galen Data, which is a great company we worked with in the past. Um, so, you know, for us, it's much more of a traditional um, software kind of, of um, structure. So, you know, we look at, for us, we want to look at something, we are, tend to be seed investors or small A. Um, do you have, you know, where is your product? Um, usually we want to find at least an MVP because we, you know, without the regulatory hurdles, um, you should, we hope to be there. Um, and then uh, really commercialization uh, in early, you know, early sales. Uh, we think about that, then we start looking at, okay, you know, if you've got that, we've got sort of product market fit and at least it's been proven a little bit, can it scale? Um, and so for us, you know, we think about it, nobody really knows when you're projecting any form of revenue, no matter what it is. Um, it's, um, it's particularly hard when you have to do with, you know, FDA approvals and things, but it's still hard when you don't. Um, but, you know, what are the value of those customers? If you do have, you know, is it a long term customer contract? So it's a B2B kind of a play. Is it, um, you know, how are the switching costs? How, um, what are your, your um, you know, churn likes? So you can have a, what's your lifetime value of a customer and your customer acquisitions costs? At the end of the day, what we want to do is minimize risk to the extent we can, and then figure out, can this thing grow to a certain period that gives us the return we want? That's how we think about our valuations. We use a quote VC method, where we say, we need to make 10X. 
uh, our money. And um, therefore, if these things are 10 X revenue um, kind of businesses that exit, what is our, what is our, um, you know, if we invest a hundred thousand or whatever it is today, how much does that need to be worth in the future for us to hit 10 X? And we think, okay, what's the probability of that happening? And that's kind of what we, the way we think about it. Um, and yeah. All right. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to move us along here to our next topic, which is COVID-19 and just ask you which categories, which types of medical devices, including software as a medical device are thriving today more because of the, the current global pandemic and which have been hardest hit uh, by COVID-19. Tim, I'm going to, I'm going to launch this part of our discussion with you. Sure. Well, I'd answer this in two parts. One, what's thriving that's currently on the market right now? I think it's pretty clear to most people that will be on a call like this, which is anything that has telemedicine roots, uh, kind of making anything that would typically be a in-person type visit or anything go virtual, uh, connectivity, patient-to-patient um, -patient connectivity platforms, things like that, clearly. Um, as well as diagnostics. I mean, anybody that just happened to have a diagnostic ready for COVID got lucky, right? And and I think they're doing really well right now. Uh, I don't think that necessarily translates into what we find particularly exciting for investment purposes, because investing in a device you know, that's not commercial uh, stage, or especially if you expect it to be 12 to 18 to 24 months out, um, not we're not particularly investing in a COVID diagnostics platform business uh, business plan. And so I would say that you know, to, if you're looking at what we're excited about looking forward, of course, there's the idea of the software plays and everything going from uh, telemedicine type things and patient connectivity platforms. You know, they, they were the future and the future might just have gotten moved up five to 10 years. So there's a little bit more excitement around that. But we still, when it comes to medical devices and kind of the, the medical devices you touch and feel, as Charlie was pointing out, and we're still really excited about women's health. We think there's a lot going on in women's health, and it's been, you know, really a lot of the uh, new science and the like is allowing people to get and make devices that are, you know, spot on and can be done for smaller market sizes um, and, and do that in a cost effective manner that winds up giving a good venture return. We've seen a lot of good uh, women's health devices. You know, cardio is still cardio, right? So cardio, <laughs> cardio devices, it's it's the biggest category, and there's a lot of really good stuff going on. And and we get excited about several things that have come across our desk. And then the idea of wearables is becoming all all the more important now for two reasons. You know, initially you talk about the monitoring for monitoring sake reason. And you know, there's a lot of that out there, which you know, everything from blood pressure, uh, blood pressure to glucose levels, and you can essentially measure anything as you're walking around these days, seemingly. And there's some value in being able to know those numbers, but translating that into you know, real life outcomes and value for your money is still a little bit out, I would say. But what we have seen is that pharma companies have really picked up on on some of these wearable devices for their own clinical uh, trials and in measuring outcomes and the like. So you see a lot of these wearables and patches and uh, um, other devices, et cetera, that have two revenue streams. One is the monitoring aspect that they were originally conceived for, but a lot are finding that uh, a pharma services play is a more immediate and lucrative you know, early commercialization uh, idea. And that's been really helpful for a lot of the companies. So we see a lot of that going on. All right, thank you. Nat, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly uh, COVID hit a lot of things. Anything having to do with it that may be related to um, sort of, uh, um, you know, non-required kind, of, um, kind of activities uh, seem to take a little bit of a, a backseat. Um, the stuff that we still kind of like, AI analytics, machine learning, um, things that uh, revenue cycle management focus on, um, streamlining the the process, uh, for example, and, and patient experience, um, things of that nature, um, seem to do well. Uh, you know, other things that we've seen, you know, contact tracing. We've seen devices related to contact tracing that have gotten some interest. Uh, you know, I certainly agree with what Tim said about uh, a lot of the wearables and and that taking a, a big 
move forward. Um, there seems to be a lot of interest in um, sort of mental health, whether that's delivered remotely or something like a headspace, that, that's an area that's taking off as well. Um, but the things that are more, um, yeah, I guess, yeah, orthopedic devices and cardiovascular devices, um, uh, things like that, that are, are, are more, mm, it seemed to be more on the invasive side, uh, it seemed to take a little bit of a, of a breather. Um, partially because maybe the investments, people kind of step back a little bit um, with the risk management of, of investments um, uh, until, until kind of COVID seemed to clear up. And the good news is that, that certainly funding has rebounded. And um, on the whole, we're ahead of where I think we've ever been, uh, certainly from a digital health perspective. All right, Charlie, what gets your attention more today than it might have a year ago? And what gets your attention less? Yeah, Tim and Nat have covered uh, covered this topic pretty well. I had some similar notes to Tim's for sure. Um, I'd say if you think about stages, right, a company that's at clinical stage right now is going to be a lot harder to raise money. I mean, it's already hard to raise money at clinical stage. I'd argue that's probably the hardest kind of in your R&D phase, but also clinical. But, um, you know, we have one company that's in enrollment phases and enrollments went to zero, right? And you've budgeted all this money, right? And when enrollments go to zero, guess what? We still got heads we're paying salaries for. And so the funding needs are rising every day, uh, which is one of the tricky things about bet investing in med tech. Med tech is a hard space to invest in because of the exact reasons. The FDA comes back and says, we need 50 more patients. Well, guess what? We got to fund the entire company while we get those 50 more patients. And so trying to get your funding needs accurate is tough to do in the early days of med tech, but um, worthwhile exercise for sure. But anything that's at clinical stage, you're looking to enroll patients, especially in something that is that is elective, right? Something that doesn't have to be done. And so I think that's just going to be a really hard space to raise money in the near term here. I mean, that would we would probably just be like, we will, we'll talk to you in a couple of quarters because we can't enroll. And so enrollment's even starting to pick up, but you just had this new question of, is the patient willing to just go to the doctor to get their checkups on the device or, or, or whatever, kind of how the, the study's working. But, um, you know, something that's post FDA approval and is at commercialization stage that maybe sells into a space that is not elective, that is something that you have to get done, maybe in the cardio space or something like that might be more interesting, but that's how it made me think about stages versus they talked about the different kind of, you know, verticals and uh, device types. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good advice. That's good advice. All right, our, our third topic is pitching, you know, breaking through the clutter. I, I'm sure you guys receive, uh, even before COVID, tons of deals, but given COVID, what is the best approach now to capturing your attention, getting in front of you with limited travel resources, limited networking opportunities? Uh, Nat, let's uh, kind of round it out here and, and start uh, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so traction is the best thing for us. Uh, you know, that, that ranks above just about anything else because it proves a lot of the other things that we're going to look at. Like, is there a work on, you know, business model? Is it, is it a good product? So we really look at, you know, do you have paying customers, ideally? That's, that's number one. Or you know, do you have a POC? Do you have contracts signed up if you don't have that? Um, so that's the, the number one thing to us. Um, we look at, um, you know, the, the way to get into us, if, if you were to ask me, I would say try to network your way in. We do, we do try to respond to inbound stuff, but, you know, like everyone, we, we receive a lot of interest, thankfully. Um, so I would say, you know, try to find, network your way in through, through, um, through uh, LinkedIn or whatever you take. Try to find a lead, and then that lead will reach out to a lot of other folks for you or, or make introductions. Uh, and those are much warmer introductions um, if you can do it that way. Um, and, you know, you got to pound the pavement that we've got relationships you know, on the accelerator side with more than 225 venture folks right now all around the world that we reach out to. And the reality is, you know, even really good companies that just not always a fit uh, with with each one. So it's just a lot of um, a lot of working um, and, you know, making sure you, you do show well uh, when you do send that that one pager to me is, is really put all your hard hitters up front. You know, um, whether that, that's traction, we've got this. This is why we're we're different. And you don't have to have the best, I mean, it doesn't have to be something that nobody's ever seen before. In some ways, then you have a harder time proving the, the market. Um, you know, it doesn't market just for this thing. Um, but you got to show how you're differentiated. Um, and then again, to me, because of, of our background, show me the money. Uh, show me why this is a good investment. Um, so that's kind of a, a summary of what I'd like to see and what makes me want to call people back um, when, when I get a, an inbound, um, you know, referral. Or, or when you know a friend of mine in another VC fund for something, all right? I definitely take a look. So Charlie, I just can't drop in on your office anymore because no one's working in the office. What's the best way to get my my deal in front of you? 
I would not advise ever dropping in on any VC's office without an appointment. <laughs> you will not get a meeting. Uh, no, but I think, you know, getting into our inbox and getting a meeting set up with a VC is really not much different now than it was pre-COVID because you're just trying to get that first meeting. Now, yeah, maybe you would have met me at an event or a conference or something, but but that's a very small part of the deal. I mean, the number one way that anybody's going to say is, is through a soft intro, right? We're all on LinkedIn, at least I am. I got a lot of connections on there. You're going to find some way to, to get to us, an entrepreneur, a lawyer, an accountant, um, any any kind of way. That, that's usually the best. I'm very much going to look at that and respond to that. But we read cold emails. We just funded a company in COVID that was a cold email to me that um, never met the founder in person, did everything over Zoom. And and we funded the company. We funded another company. We only I didn't mention before, we only do three or four new investments a year. And we funded two during COVID where we didn't have any in-person meetings. So I don't think that's necessarily slowing us down. I think everything, you know, came to a halt, obviously, in kind of March, April time frame. But we're very active. We, we could have made another investment or two. We got really close on a couple others. And um, but I'd say, yeah, definitely, definitely a warm intro. And you can go straight through our website, too. Um, but in the end, you know, an entrepreneur is going to need hustle to go get those first customers to go convince people to come work at their risky startup. And so, you know, the investors are looking for them to kind of hustle and track them down too. But I think it's pretty easy to find us today with LinkedIn and websites and whatever. Tim, what's the best way to get my great idea in front of you and your attention? That's good. Well, yes, yes, and yes to everything um, Matt and Charlie said. The two quick things I would add on top of that is, or one is, make sure you have quality advisors um, and, and you can show them off. I mean, and, and a lot of times when you, especially if you don't have a warm intro, I mean, we looked at a couple companies this year just because we looked at the advisor list and knew they were some of the big, bigger names in the space. And we said, wow, you know, if Keith Drake's willing to sign up to be a part of that, I want, I want to know what's going on, right? And so I do think that it becomes a little bit more because you can't meet people as much and, you know, there's less ways to get to folks. Just making sure that you surround yourself with as good quality people as possible before you start sharing your materials. I think I think that's important. And the other thing is just to know who you're talking to. And it sounds crazy, right? But I would say the majority of decks and people that I get the cold outreach, outreach from don't. And what do I mean by that? It's not that hard to find out what stage a VC invests in. So, you know, when I get cold emails that is for angel funding or seed funding asking me if I want to fund the company, it's a little annoying, right? Because it, it kind of is putting the burden on me to figure things out when that's a very knowable aspect to what we do in our business. Now, I'm not saying if you're not in our stage, don't reach out, but reach out differently. I don't, I've had companies and I'm happy to help always and connect with earlier round, uh, connect folks with people that invest earlier than me. I right? then if they invest, then it's good for me because now I have my own pipeline. So it's not like don't come to us if you don't have a company that we can invest in immediately, but approach differently. Now, I've had emails that say, hey, Tim, guess what? Uh, we know uh, this is an early company for you, but we'd like to talk to uh, talk to you about it, see if you'd be interested by the time we got to your stage of investing, and can you help us find some earlier round investors? You know, I'm a lot more likely to want to dig in and help out and do that than somebody just blindly sending me and saying, hey, would you invest in my company when they want a $250,000 check and we write $5 million in up checks? Again, that's kind of putting the burden on the, uh, on the VC to kind of figure out what you want, what you need, and then come back to you with suggestions on how they can help you. And that's just a lot of time, uh, considering we get hundreds of these each a year. Well, Tim, that's interesting to know. There's another Keith Drake in the medical device space. I'll be curious uh, for you to introduce <laughs> him to me. Uh, but appreciate that. We're gonna, I'm gonna lightning round our fourth and final uh, roundtable discussion. I wanna make sure we leave enough time at the end for uh, questions from our audience. So just uh, maybe more brief answers to 2021 and beyond. Uh, what is the near term and future vision for digital healthcare technology and medical devices uh, starting here in a, in a month or so? Who wants to who wants to take a stab at this? Where do you see our industry going? I'll piggyback on what Tim said earlier. We're kind of consumerization of med tech where you have 
all these wearables and things that are giving you data, but but the user experience is better with maybe actionable insights where you get a read out of something. Do I write it down to my doctor or do I call 911? You know, what does it really mean to me versus just everybody calling their doctor? So they, you'll see that. And I think now and beyond, we're not going to get away from taking an invasive procedure, making it minimally invasive. I think everything needs to be minimally invasive if possible. But I think that trend will continue. I'll uh, I'll give a few thoughts as well. I, I think from you know, at least from our perspective, um, analytics, um, personal uh, person enabled health kind of stuff. Uh, um, Charlie was just mentioning, uh, and functionality and in interoperability. Uh, those are things that we see a lot, and so that can include um, data security, privacy, efficiency, um, enterprise software uh, solutions, things that make things work better um, and and are, are safer. Um, but again, we, we see a lot on the analytics side just because that can help um, across the board in many different ways. Very good. Tim? Building on those comments, I would add two things. One is robotics, um, the, the idea in, in robotic surgery and the use of robot, uh, robots in you know, any type of uh, medical procedure, I think, is, is definitely a, a wave of the future. And the, what, one thing that I always come back to is the promise of quantum computing and what that can do for the biotech industry. I mean, I don't, we, we don't invest in biotech, but really, if you look at pharmaceutical companies, the R&D is under siege and it's been harder and harder and more expensive to get uh, products across the line and the products they get across the line aren't as successful as they were in the past. That's not a recipe for, for future success. So I really do think that, you know, the ability of quantum computing to unlock, you know, a lot of different uh, type of drug combinations and, and drug candidates, I. I'm really excited to see where that leads us. Very insightful. Uh, appreciate, appreciate that, all, all three of you gentlemen. All right, we're going to transition to our second poll of the day. And just to, just to get a finger on the pulse, what your, to our audience, what your funding needs are. Uh, you might be in good shape. You don't need any additional resources right now. Uh, you need seed early stage funding to get started. Uh, you're focused on Series A funding. You require series B or beyond, and perhaps you're not a good candidate for funding. And if I could just have one of my panelists chime in, can you still hear me and see me? Yep. Very good. All right, so you're in good shape. You don't need any more money. I'm not sure anybody's gonna fall in that category. Uh, you need seed or early stage funding, you're focused on Series A, you need Series B or beyond, and you're not a candidate for funding. So we'll go ahead and close this poll out. Before we get to our q and I'd like to just suggest for our audience what your next steps are. Uh, to our first uh, mini round table, think about where you are regarding the breakpoints, the achievements that our panelists share they're looking at. What can you focus on now uh, to make your solution more attractive to venture capital. Uh, number two, uh, is your medical device more attractive to venture capitalists due to COVID-19? If not, how can you reposition it? I think you guys launched with telemedicine, connected health, remote monitoring. Uh, you may have a medical device that uh, the Galen Cloud could, could perhaps provide that telemedicine aspect too. And together, that's a very powerful combination of your device and monitoring our connectivity solution that gets the uh, attention of venture capitalists. And then lastly, Galen Data, let us know if we can help. Uh, you know, we're, we're a full service organization. We not only provide cloud connectivity, we have a, uh, a, a cadre of partners that we work with, including the three gentlemen on the panel today. Let us know how we can help. Uh, I, before we get to our q and I'll make an announcement for our next uh, Galen Data webinar. It'll be next year, January 19th. Uh, the title is Medical Device Journeys from Concept Through Growth to Acquisition. Our guest is uh, Rene Van de Zandy. He's the founder of Emergo, uh, started, ran, grew, and ran that business for a number of years. It was acquired three years ago by Underwriters Laboratory, and he'll be sharing actual insights and lessons learned uh, from the founder of a leading global medical device regulatory consulting firm. Uh, I've met with Renee. He's going to have a wonderful journey to share with our audience. So we're going to get to our, our uh, 
our questions now. As a reminder, you can submit your questions in the questions window in the GoToWebinar console. Uh, we will make a recording of our webinar available afterwards. I see we've got a bunch of questions coming in already. The first one, and I'll just, whoever wants to take a stab at it, raise your hand, go for it. Question reads, I'm about six to nine months away from clinical trials and I need funding to get through them. I Googled, I found several VC firms that seem ideal. What is your advice on how to cold call them? We touched on this somewhat, but if you could just reinforce that and maybe add some color. Yeah. I would say, you know, I mentioned earlier, we funded a, a company that cold emailed us during COVID, um, but I didn't elaborate, you know, first try to get the intro through somebody warm, but if you do the cold media email, when you do the reach out and you can typically play around with people's names and present there, I mean, my name's just Charlie at S3VC, that's my email, you know, most of them are pretty simple like that, but um, so feel free to defend me your, your, your pitch, but um, I make it very simple on that first page. And often we'll get an email that's got six paragraphs of information that's super detailed in the product. Your only goal is to get me to read that email and think, yes, this is interesting enough to have an intro meeting. And so keep your deck concise, you know, eight, 10, 12 slides should be plenty to just get the high level story across and the bullets, you know, the, the company that we funded, he had literally, it was probably three sentences. This is the traction I have on the, on my users, blah, 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 and a couple of, you know, like, oh, that's interesting. And then I clicked on the deck and it looked interesting. And I said, let's set up a call. This looks pretty interesting. Um, and so I would just urge on keeping it as clear and concise as as you can and, and enlist help from, from others. A lot of people say, I don't want to tell someone about my idea because they're going to steal it. That is a remote, remote possibility in almost every case. Talk to as many people as you can about your business, get as much feedback as you can, let people shoot holes in it, and talk to some people that might help you craft that story to get it really concise and, and get people's attention. Matt, Tim, anything to add? No, no, I think it's not perfect. Add. Yeah, I mean, just keep it yeah concise because it can get complicated, but your, your goal, is, as, as Charlie already said, is, is not to explain the entire thing. It's to get enough interest to say, hey, I want to learn more. Um, so that's that's what you want to do to get somebody excited. And I want to underscore that, you know, ultimately I'm an engineer that tries to pretend to be a business person. Engineers, we want to explain everything in gory detail because we feel if we don't, we're not fully um, sharing what our idea is. Many of the companies we work with um, as, as either clients or potential clients, engineers. And so being concise is a challenge. So I would, to our audience, uh, just recommend following the advice of our panelists, be as concise as possible. Yeah, I would just um, add real quick, a shameless plug for the S3 website below there. We have a section resources for entrepreneurs where we have a blog post about meeting one, which is once you get that initial meeting, how do you kind of set up for that hour pitch that you'll have? And also we have some free uh, financial model templates you can download, some specifically for medical device that can help you go build out your kind of initial business plan and, and help you figure out how much, how much what your funding needs would be. That's great. I appreciate you sharing that, Charlie. Uh, kind of a follow on question. Next question that has come in. The trend seems to be moving away from a full blown 50 to 100 page business plan and more towards pitch decks that are abbreviated. What is your advice? All right. I'm going to jump in on this one. Uh, so uh, you st it's a good exercise. The, the reality is, yes, the deck is the way to go because um, people are busy and you need to keep it concise just like with the original um, pitch that's what the standard is but all that stuff that you would normally have in an 80 page um, business plan should still be reflected summary form in in the deck you want to have it not necessarily every little bit of it but anything that's not in the deck the, the most important stuff should be in the deck and everything else should be in the data room so you should have the same stuff because that's important stuff you just don't need to have it all out in prose in the old school way um, but too often we get, you know, we'll get stuff over the, over the kind of the, the transom and, and it just won't be well thought out. Like, well, here's our, our revenue. And of course, everybody's revenue does this, you know, or this, I guess, on the other way. Um, and so it's, um, you know, you got to be able to, to provide the rationale behind that. And OK, what is the buildup for that? How many how many customers is it? How are you going to get them? How much is it going to cost? Where they're going to generate? How long are they going to be there? Um, you know, to, to kind of prove that out. And then, you know, you, so you can connect the dots. You don't have to have all that in the deck, uh, but you should have the, the assumptions. Um, so anyway, that's my thought is it, it's, it's not a bad exercise. You don't have to actually build it, but ultimately all that info, you're going to want to have in one form or another um, summarized in the deck and then, you know, for, for due diligence and in the data room. 
I like that. I like that. Um, that leads into our next question. What level of detail are you looking for regarding financial projections? How far out should the part financial projections run? I, I think that depends on what stage you're at. I mean, financial projections, when you're raising the seed round, I mean, are a bit ridiculous. I would focus on, is this a problem worth being solved? Is it a big enough problem? What's the market? And why is my device, you know, either new and innovative and therefore the right solution or a better version of anything else that's out there right if you can prove that at a seed stage i think you're fine when you get into the bigger checks the a and b rounds i think you do want to see at least five years out and you know if you're if you need seven years to a pma um you know, uh, approval, then do seven or do eight. So, you know, one year of commercialization or whatever you expect. Again, we'll take a look at that and probably disagree by what is the magnitude, um, just because again, you do see that hockey stick uh, just about anywhere you look. But it does show that A, you're conscious of how you're building a business that you can write a very good operating plan and that you know what type of levers to put in there. Um, just one example of a company, we were really far into looking at it. They sent an operating plan and it essentially had infinite scale, right? I mean, it had, what I mean by that is had $8 million of uh, sales and marketing as a $8 million revenue company and had $8 million of sales and marketing as a literally, I'm not kidding, $450 million company. Um, and, it, you know, that, that type of thing just shows that there's no business sense right in in the team or just a lack of understanding of, of what the future could look like so i do think you know five to seven years out it's important um to to do that as an exercise and to show that you understand what's coming in the future that you're prepared for it and that you know essentially you do have your your i's are dotted your t's are crossed you know, does it have to be exactly right? Are we looking at, oh man, they're off by 10% on our projections, therefore we're not gonna fund them? No, right? But the exercise of showing that you can go through it is is an important one. As a follow one, and this did not come in, but you remind me, how much do you guys look at reimbursement codes, either direct or ancillary for the medical device solution? How important is that in the financial projections and your overall decision to invest? It depends on if there's existing or if they're going to go after a new code. I think that's definitely more when you're getting to that commercialization stage. You know, our company, TBA Medical, you know, there there was they were going to cobble together some codes, but they ended up really needing to go get their own code, and that was part of the acquisition and, and an earnout, which they were able to successfully do. But but um, in those later stages, you're definitely thinking about that. And the patient's running through. I mean, that's a that's an assumption in your revenue. So either using or cobbling together some old codes, or you're going to go after and get your new code but that's a long process as well and it's uh you know if you're in a space that you're going to get paid by reimbursement it's just another hurdle to getting funding and and it's another one of the unknowns and that makes investing in medtech really hard yeah i would i would say the same i mean uh, for later stage your payer mix and your codes are, are important and <clears throat> not that it's going to be a, a big driver but um you know we had uh, sold a company once and i was an investment banker that laboratory services and, and they did uh, fish testing and, and uh, um, the reimbursement rate for fish testing went it was cut by 80% in one year. So that had a material impact on the uh, operations of the business because uh, that was the significant portion of what they did. Um, so, you know, I do think, um, yeah, it's more applicable to later stage, but but that does, again, kind of go to, you know, do you have to prove out your revenues? It's more about the assumptions and, and you know, as Tim was mentioning earlier, have you thought through it? How is it with this work? Um, and that those are, I mean, that's a driver so you want to have have a good explanation of that and uh, that gives people more comfort um and and, and i think it's rational as you think about how you're gonna get paid um you know from our side when we think about projections um five years um because that's about what we think we were going to look at in an exit we're probably not going to believe the last two maybe three um but we we do want to be able to connect um the dots on at least probably the next 18 months particularly if you're post product and sort of just kind of again connecting those dots um uh, and, and trying to figure out the trajectory um, as we think about it um and, and it doesn't sense. necessarily have to be yeah it doesn't have to necessarily be revenue it can be if, if you're not making money um if you raise a uh, seed how is that going to get me to series 
to, to Series A, and then how is that going to get me to to you know the next hurdle? We, we, Charlie and Tim already hit that earlier, but that's also what you explain. If you're not focused on revenue, then okay, well, this money is going to be spent here, and it's going to get me this. If you that's I really want to explain. I want people to explain that to me. I don't want people to come in and say, well, it's a huge market. We're going to get one percent. Everybody thinks they're going to get one percent of every market. That's hard. Um, you know, and, and just show me how you're going to get there and, and why this makes sense. And then the payoff from there, because it's a probability. It's a probability on a probability on a probability. And, and that's what you want to address from a risk management perspective. Um, we've got about two more minutes, two to three more minutes. I want to get to a couple more questions. Here's a good one. I would be interested to know if the panelists see differences in funding opportunities for traditional medical devices versus software as a medical device. What are y'all's thoughts on that? I'm happy to jump in. I think software is it's a completely different animal, and I would say it's much it's going to be much easier for a software company, just generally speaking, than than a medical device company because they don't have the um, generally software as a medical device is not going to be as highly regulated as a medical device. But kind of there's three evolutions of the company um, that, that I talked about, and you have to underwrite all this huge clinical risk and other stuff. I think it's just easier to do in, in the software space. Uh, it's a little more predictable. You're usually going to be generating revenue way earlier, um, and it has kind of it scale, a software company just scales a lot differently than than a med tech company does. So I think that's probably going to be a more attractive space from for most investors. But there's definitely people that are just focused on traditional medical device. I think it's it's less binary um, in many ways because you know you the still may have to go through FDA approval and things like that, but it's it's different level. Um, the payoff may, may not be as as big. Um, but it, it's, I think, in, in many ways, a little bit less risky. So it's not a, it's going to get, it's going to make it or it's not going to make it as much. You have, you know, more ability to pivot and, um, and still make it work. We got time for one more question, and we're going to shift our focus to intellectual property and patents. How much impact does the patent portfolio have on your appetite to invest in a medical device startup? Is the value of patents comparable? Uh, that to preclinical or first in human data. How important are patents in your investment decision? I would say they're important, but they're not going to be as important as clinical data. Um, I mean, uh, the patent's kind of a check and make sure that either you're free to operate and or you know, you're going to have some type of protection. But really, the clinical data is saying, can your device do what you're saying it can do? Right? Essentially, the entire company and the ability to make money someday rides on the device being able to do what you say it's going to do or what it's purported to do. So I I, I would say you know IP is important, um, but if I think it's a false comparison to kind of put it up against clinical data. Yes, it's important. Yes, it's a must-have, but I, I don't think anything you know trumps how good the product works. Got about thirty seconds left. Anybody else have uh, anything to contribute to the uh, the patent question? Or doesn't matter on the software side. Yeah, on the software side, completely not relevant. In the end, when you get acquired, you're going to need some strong patents in place. The big acquirers are going to want some protection. So as the company matures, there needs to be a patent strategy there. But having them issued in the very early days is, is not going to have a huge impact. Makes sense. Makes sense. So I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all of our questions. We have run out of time. I'd like to thank our panelists for a very engaging and insightful discussion. Appreciate uh, all y'all's time. And, and thanks to our audience as well for attending our webinar today and for your insightful questions. Um, I will remind everybody the, uh, the Galen Cloud, its features and benefits. Uh, where we stand ready to help you with your cloud connectivity needs. The Galen Cloud is a turnkey connectivity solution for a wide range of medical devices and digital health resources. It includes access control, onboard analytics, industry leading security, and is regulatory compliant. Now for our audience, when we end the webinar, please click the close button to take a short optional survey to let us know how we did and how we can improve our future webinars. We look forward to seeing you at a future Galen Data webinar. Uh, please, please let us know if there's anything else we can help you with before then. Gentlemen, thank you once again. Appreciate your time, your insight, your expertise. It's been a wonderful webinar. Um, thank you to our audience for attending. Uh, so I will say at this point to everybody, thanks again and goodbye. Thank you.